Hello everybody and welcome back to the second shelf and to another recent reads video on Sunday. Uh, and this time I'm talking about books that I read sort of in the first half of December. So I'm slowly sort of working my way through my back list of books that I haven't talked to you about. So first half of December. And the first book I want to talk to you about is Terra Nullius by J Claire G. Coleman. Uh, the book came out in 2017. And Claire G. Coleman is an Australian writer um, and she is a poet also. I, ha I didn't read her poetry, so I'm just citing uh, Wikipedia. Uh, but uh, Terra Nullius is her debut novel. Um, the novel got quite some buzz on, on Booktube, but also uh, was nominated for various awards. Um, I, you know, if you look at Goodreads, there's a lot of positive reviews on the novel. And I, I started maybe with too high, um, my expectations were too high, because I didn't think it was a very good book, unfortunately. Uh, but let me back up uh, to the story. The, um, it's marketed as a sci-fi novel, so you already know when you start reading it that there might be something going on that you don't really understand right from the start because it opens very powerful with a young man, a boy almost, Jack, who is running. He is one of the natives, as they are called in the book, uh, in the colony, Australia, and he is running from the settlers. Um, this the, the scene where he's, you know, it goes on for quite some time where he's running, trying to hide, trying to find refuge. And of course, uh, oh, well, I don't know, of course, but for me, of course, it was this idea that we are talking about, you know, the British settlers and the indigenous Australian people being mistreated and one of them, Jack, is running away. But of course, that's not what the book is about because there is a twist about one third into the book and then we learn the true nature of the settlers and the natives and everything else. I'm not going to tell you because I don't want to spoil your surprise if you want to pick up the novel. It's a very political novel, obviously, trying to tell us stories about uh, colonization, how it works and what happens if people are colonized by a foreign power. Um, and that's all very well. But my main issue, I had two main issues with the book. The first one is that this idea that Claire Coleman obviously had to tell the story of Australia um, from a sci-fi point of view with, you know, with a, with a twist and a, 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 a twist in the plot um, that is very interesting. But my qualm with, with sci-fi is always a twist or a quirk is just not enough. Uh, that's it, It's a brilliant idea and the, the first the third is very well done, but then you need a story. And I didn't think there was much to the story. It was not very well developed. The characters then became quite flat in my opinion. So even the best twist is just, you know, a quirk if there is no story. And for me, there was not enough story. The second uh, problem with the book I had is that I thought uh, Hachette, the Australian uh, publisher, did a really, really poor job editing the book. The <clears throat> language was, the, the writing was okay, but there I counted like within 20 or 30 pages, I counted 12 times or whatever the word totally. Stuff like that, you know, that you that that really irked me when I uh, the the more I read, the more it irked me, and I thought that that the editing was really poor and that it didn't help the quality of the book. But still, you know me; I'm a very plot-oriented reader, and if I think the plot is weak, I will not enjoy a book. I will not give it a high rating. But many uh, Australian uh, readers love the book because it's so political and because of the, the twist that I indicated. Um, so you should, if, you, if you're interested at all uh, in, in, in this book, you should probably check out other reviews and not only depend on mine. But for me, the book was just had a two week story and it was poorly edited. So I, I, I didn't think it was very good, unfortunately. 
The next book I read uh, was a reread for me, and that was Virginia Woolf's *The Waves*, published in 1931. I read this as a buddy read uh, with Sean over at uh, Sean the Book Maniac, uh, but he he bailed halfway through. It, it was just not the right time. It was a reread for him as well, and he just it was not the right time for him to reread the book. Um, uh, I, um, I I I really think The Waves is is a brilliant book. It's one of Virginia Woolf's most, um, how can you say that, uh, most experimental works. It follows five characters uh, from uh, childhood into adulthood and you know when when late adulthood and it's it's structured in in only stream of consciousness so you have these voices of each of the protagonists um telling you in in sort of monologues about what happens it's not even though it's it's very thin it's it's not a quick read at all you really have to concentrate um but it, it's very much worth uh, worth your time um uh, I had a, a very short discussion on Twitter with, with Eric from uh, The Lonesome Reader, who, who loves this book, uh, and rightfully so, uh, and who asked me when he saw my Goodreads why I gave it only four stars and not five. And I think that is a very personal, very subjective um, um, evaluation that this book, for me, is an intellectual adventure, and I enjoy that very much, but it's... I, I don't really uh, connect emotionally with the book, uh, unlike Eric, who, who did so. Uh, but that is something that has nothing to do with the quality of the book. That's just my personal experience. For me, it's, yeah, it's intellectual. The enjoyment is intellectual, but it's not deeply affecting me, if that makes sense. Uh, but if you're interested in Virginia Woolf's work, and especially in a more experimental stream of consciousness book, then this is absolutely uh, worth giving it a try if you haven't read it yet. The next book I read was also quite a buzz book in 2018, and that was Kate Atkinson's new novel, Transcription. Um, if you're following me, um, you know that I really loved her book, Life After Life. Um, so I was looking forward uh, to, to her new one. Uh, transcription is set in three different timelines. We have the 1940s, the 1950s, and 1981. Um, the main character is Juliet Armstrong, who in 1940 is just 18 years old, and she is recruited by MI5 um, to monitor um, the fascist sympathizers in Britain during the war. Then this work ends after the war, of course, and then in the 1950s, uh, Juliet works for the BBC, but gets entangled again in spy work. And then we have 1981. The book opens in 1981 when Juliet has an accident, um, and you know from the start that she will probably not survive uh, the, the, this accident, a car accident. Um, I thought uh, the idea of, I, I love spy novels, <laughs> so the idea of um, how, how this worked in the 1940s uh, with the, um, you know, w how p people got involved in, 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 in spy, in espionage, how it's described, the, the fascist uh, sections in, in Britain, I thought that was all really, really entertaining and fast-paced, it's well a well-written well book. I thought the uh, second big part, 1950s, was a bit muddled. Uh, I didn't enjoy it as much. And the 1981 part is really short. It's just the beginning um, and the end, basically. Uh, and we know that in in between, between 1950 and 1981, stuff happens and that Juliet hasn't been back in the UK for a long time. So um, I didn't... Enjoy. I enjoyed the book. It's entertaining. It's, like I said, fast-paced, well-written in your typical Kate Atkinson style. But for me, it was not as good or as brilliant as uh, Life After Life. Um, but again, like I said before with The Waves and with Terra Nullius, that is my... That has more to do with me, probably, than with the book. I thought... Uh, the final twist of transcription, there is a final twist uh, at the end, 
um, for me was way too obvious uh, in, in the, the clues that, that Kate Atkinson's left for the reader, I thought were too obvious. Uh, so I was not surprised at all by this final twist. Um, uh, I, I can't, of course, talk about this twist, but let me just say, if you are at all familiar with the Cambridge Five and you start reading the book, you will know what I'm talking about. So I can recommend it, and I think a lot of Kate Atkinson's fan, uh, Atkinson fans loved it much more than I did. So it's certainly uh, uh, worth your time, and it's entertaining, um, and it, it's, you know, a, a good spy novel. But for me, it was just not as brilliant as I had hoped. The next book I read was quite a tome, and that was Middlemarch by George Eliot at 920 pages. It's probably the biggest book that I read in 2018. I wanted to, it was my first read of Middlemarch. Uh, I've been meaning to read it for a long time, um, but yeah, I never gotten around to it for various reasons, and I have to say that the 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 length of the book sort of you know had me at awe and anticipation, but also a little anxious. Uh, but it it is a, if you haven't read Middlemarch, don't be put off by the lengths like I have been for years because it's really really easy to conquer this tome in the sense of you you can. Yeah, fly through it is maybe an exa uh, is exaggerating, but it's not difficult to stick with the book and to read it. Um, Middlemarch, George Eliot, of course, is one of the big Victorian writers, um, does need an introduction. And the book Middlemarch is set not in the Victorian era, but just before. So in 1831, 32, um, uh, uh, the, the the end of the Regency uh, era. Uh, Middlemarch is a small provincial town uh, in the Midlands, a fictitious town, and we have a variety of characters living there. We have, of course, Dorothea Brooke, one of the main characters, a young woman who wants to, she's, you know, she has this idealistic view of what she wants to achieve in the world. She wants to do good. And then she enters a horrendously bad marriage. Um, we have other couples who sort of show us the life in this provincial town. We have this a doctor uh, who wants to, you know, uh, advanced the medical profession and he makes a bad match as well um, with the the town beauty who is rather shallow um, and then there are you know 10 or 12 other characters uh, too many because I don't want to talk about this book <laughs> forever and ever but but that's not the point the point is that this book shows us life in the 1830s in a provincial town in the Midlands in England. You have a lot of politics. We learn about the reform bill that has just uh, been announced uh, reforming uh, the election. But we also learn about, you know, uh, religion. Uh, Dorothea is in the beginning a very religious person, but she has her doubts. We have people who want to be um, good but make bad decisions. Uh, it, it's a kaleidoscope of life uh, compressed into these 900 pages and I really loved it. Um, so if you haven't read Middlemarch, uh, I, I would say just give it a try. The writing is not, I wouldn't say easy uh, in the sense that it's, you know, a, a, a language that is just middle grade, not at all, but it's not difficult in the way I expected it to be. Um, and even the fact that there are so many characters in the book is not difficult to keep track of because George Eliot succeeds in giving each of the characters enough room, hence the book is so, is so huge, and um, a very distinct voice. So Unlike the problem I have with some Russian novels where I really have to write down the names in order to keep track of all of them, 
I didn't have that problem here at all. Uh, I, I loved the, the atmosphere of that time that uh, George Eliot conveys in the book. I love the struggles of the characters. They all have depth and nuance to them. They are not cardboard figures, even the minor characters. So I... Yeah, I really love this book and I can highly recommend it to all those of you who might be anxious because it's so big. And the last book I want to talk to you about, we stay in Middlemarch sort of because that's uh, My Life in Middlemarch by Rebecca Mead, which was published um, this year, I think. Well, as always, I will leave the correct publication date down in the show notes. Uh, Rebecca Mead was born in a, a small coastal town in, in England. Uh, she studied in Oxford and then moved to the United States. She became a journalist. Um, and Middlemarch, she read it uh, when she was a young girl in her late teens for the first time. And she kept rereading it. So this book is a combination of memoir, what Middlemarch m means to Rebecca Mead, um, it's also retracing some of the steps of Middlemarch in the sense of George Eliot's life and uh, uh, where uh, she lived and when she wrote Middlemarch. Uh, so it's a co combination of memoir and reportage um, and literary criticism in a way, um, uh, trying to... Um, find out first of all personally why Middlemarch means so much to Rebecca Mead but also what uh, Middlemarch, the characters in Middlemarch, what they try to convey and what they stand for. Um, I, I liked it, I, I really liked it. it it's it's really, a, a, a ni for me it was a nice way to read it just after I finished Middlemarch for the first time. Um, it's not a book for people who haven't read Middlemarch uh, because then you will not uh, have any connection with the characters. Uh, Rebecca Mead spends a lot of time analyzing uh, characters like Dorothea Brooke or the Doctor uh, Lydgate. So if you haven't read it, the novel, then that will not mean a lot to you, I, I think. But if you read Middlemarch, even if it's some time ago, and you want to have... Uh, a personal journey of somebody who really loves the book and who read it um, many times, then this book will certainly um, enchant you. So this was it for the recent reads on Sunday, just before Christmas. Uh, I wish you all a very happy, merry Christmas um, and merry holidays. Um, if you're celebrating, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you in the comments as always, and I'll see you all soon in my next video. Bye-bye.